This week, we interview the one, the only, Shai Chen, creator of WavSep and SecToolMarket.com, the largest independent review of web application scanning tools. Apollo joins us in studio for a discussion of the top 10 reasons why you should work in information security. And we close things out with stories of the week, where hopefully Santa will rant about the UL for InfoSec. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This episode is sponsored by NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise-level online scanning service. For more information, visit their website, netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean and mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at Onapsis. Dot com. It's time to fire a pack of capture and pour yourself a cold adult beverage. Give the intern control of your Bitcoin mining rig because here's your host. He's a man who's been voted one of the finest mines in West Warwick, Rhode Island, which is a lot like being named one of the top 10 best dressed in Siberia <laughs> in winter. It's Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Security Weekly. It's very, very wonderful to be here this evening. We've got a fantastic show for you. As always, first I want to introduce the cast and crew, the cast of characters, as it were. Uh, I'll start directly to my right. You can kind of see him. He's right there. Look, it's Apollo. <laughs> oh, my, oh, my God. He's here. <laughs> Apollo is here in studio. Welcome, Apollo. It's nice to have Making you. Making fantastic drinks. Good to see you guys. Fantastic. Oh. I'm drinking a Harry Larry. It's, you know, it's Harry mm -hmm. and it's Larry. Mm -hmm. Indeed. It's awesome. Ooh. It's much better with the birch beer. It's good with the birch beer, mm -hmm. isn't it? And, of course, Mr. Larry Pesci. Finally back here in studio, the oh. international man of mystery. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a lot you did of beer. Some serious travel. Yeah. If, uh, you so went right from Baltimore <laughs> to, to Berlin. Berlin. Yep. I remember you talking about that. Yeah. It was I a, was thinking about you. How that, that must have been. Yeah. It was a. It was a touch. It was German, touch and go. German was, beer. Uh, yeah, and lots of worsts. Yes. And pork knuckle. Pork knuckle. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. It was good food and good beer. Excellent, Mr. Jack Daniel. It's here with us in Where? studio. Oh. Oh. Welcome, right. Jack. Hello. Welcome. What's Thanks. going on? It's it's. I'm not making drinks. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Apollo. And I'm here. Drinks. Mere, uh, here like next week too, and then I disappear. But it's good to be with you. Here yes. In beautiful Warwick. War. No, this is Warwick. Not West Warwick is like right right there. There. That's why right. I put that so in there. Next to the. Go past the Cumberland Farms, and you're in West Warwick. Yes, is that pretty the, much. The, the, pretty much. You go by, actually, it's you go by the Cumbies. It's Cumbies, right? Cumbies. Cumbies. Well, I was, Cumbies. Cumbies. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, the, I was translating for those outside <laughs> of <laughs> the uh, Providence and Boston area. Cumbies. Like Mr. Michael Santarcangelo, who's here with us tonight. Welcome, Michael, to the show. It's always nice to be here. Yes, we've got. It's gonna be. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, first, are you ready to learn? Combat firmware analysis, register for my Black Hat course, embedded device security assessments for the rest of us, a two-day hosted class at Black Hat Las Vegas. Registration includes breakfast, lunch, access to the Black Hat briefings, business hall, sponsor workshops, sponsor sessions, and arsenal. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to, in fact, register today. And I'm, I'm told today that my class size is increasing. Nice. There were people actually on the waiting list. We had wow. to increase the wow. class size. So you made it bigger, huh? I did. I and did you stroke yeah. it a little bit? I did it well, you know, I stroked my ego a little bit right, by having right. such a large class, I guess we should right. say. It's like having a wallet made out of foreskins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you rub it and it gets bigger. <laughs> 
Wow. Wow. Where did you come up? Uh, oh, you don't hang out that. with Mike Poor. <laughs> yes. Because that is something Mike would say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I definitely hang out with Mike Poor a lot. And yeah, traveling a lot and SANS conferences, I've been hanging out with Mike Poor a lot. Nice. Nice. You say that like it's a bad thing, though. No, absolutely not. It's a great thing. I wish I could hang out with Mike more. Um, <laughs> so I want to introduce our very special guest for this evening, Mr. Shai Chen, an information security analyst, researcher, consultant, and speaker. He's a prominent blogger. In addition to his occasional attack vector publication, currently focused on publishing frameworks, evaluations, and comparisons of information security products. Shai, welcome to the show. Hey, Paul. Glad to be here. Yes, it's very nice to have you here on the show. So, Shai, uh, before we get into it, how did you get your start in information security? Well, um, it's not the typical background you hear. I was actually a software developer. I uh, had my own company, small software uh, uh, house, actually, nothing big. Uh, did some development for about four years, and then one time uh, I developed a software for one of my customers, and uh, he happened to uh, be starting his own uh, security firm. And he kind of showed me what is it, what it is I was writing, like all the vulnerabilities, and I had my code. Seemed pretty interesting, and that's pretty much it. I uh, started getting in the field, learning some uh, techniques, and uh, slowly, slowly, I got started working in it. Now, Shai, you uh, don't seem to have a Chinese accent, because when I first started seeing your work and I saw your name, it's actually kind of a funny story. I, um, what, uh, I was telling someone, and they said, oh, yeah, they're like, Shai is Israeli. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, I got I to gotta get an introduction to, to Shai, because I'm a big fan of your work. And I was talking to Israel Barak, and I'm like... I'm like, do you know this guy? Because, like, it's a total stereotype, right? I'm like, uh, uh, he's from Israel, you're from Israel. I'm like, you guys must know each other, right? Um, <laughs> so, but uh, I'm like, his name's uh, It works Shea, in Warwick. Yeah, Shay <laughs> Chen. And he's like, no, I don't know. He's like, oh, you mean Shai. And then however you pronounced your last name with, the, like, the rolling of the tongue thing. And I'm like, I thought I said I thought it was Chinese. Someone corrected me, and then you know, Israel was nice of us to um, make an introduction. So, um, but you are in fact based in Israel. Has that, um, you know, being in that geographic location? We've interviewed a couple of people from Israel. You know, being in that climate, how, how has that shaped your kind of career in information security? Oh, well, uh, not much actually. <laughs> it didn't have any specific impact. I wish I could invent some specific story, but I can't. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of security folks and a lot of security companies coming out of uh, Israel today. Has that been on an increase for a while, or has that always been the case? It's actually been kind of booming for the last uh, three or four years. Mm. It's gotten insane here. That's interesting. Plenty of, yeah, plenty of companies opening their own security hub locally, and plenty of companies kind of uh, opening either research departments and security startups. Mm. Oh, that's great. Um, so, Israel, uh, Shai, I called you Israel, <laughs> Shai, um, how, when, did you get started first evaluating web application security scanners or web application firewalls? Which one came first? Well, definitely security scanners. It's kind of derived from uh, a collection of tools I started doing back in 2005. So, I, I, it does a whole lo lot of story. Uh, that led to that. I'm not sure we have time to do all Well, now, so did you, were you developing your own web application scanner or were you developing uh, tools to evaluate web application scanners like in 2005? Well, neither. Actually, I was collecting those because I had my own pen testing team and I was mm -hmm. trying to uh, gather up tools that they could use, kind of creating uh, what I was thinking was a good methodology for them not to miss anything important. I started collecting all those tools, and initially in 2005, that there weren't many tools that which was were free and even not free mm. out there. I mean, there was so little. So I started kind of becoming obsessed, searching for everything that was published online. So initially there was there were very little tool, that amount of tools, but in 2009 I had so many, so I literally didn't know what to recommend. So it kind of came out of the need I had to figure out what to, do I recommend to my pen testers. So, <clears throat> when did you uh, first publish your first uh, evaluation of all the web application scanning tools? 
in 2010, about mm-hmm. uh, one year I f- after I figured out I can't recommend my pen testers to use seven tools in the same assessment. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So um, what is your uh, process for evaluating these web application scanning tools? Well, it kind of changed over the years, but uh, initially I'm trying to get them at their best, meaning when I take a product, I try to customize this policy so I'd be able to figure out how it does at any specific test when in under optimal conditions, okay? So let's say I'm testing SQL injection, how well the scanner identifies SQL injection. So instead of taking the default policy, I kind of remove anything that could uh, disrupt the analysis and test the SQL injection policy separately. I run it a couple of times without bugs, issues, and so on and kind of get the best score. And then I assess the tool under different conditions, like under non-optimal conditions, different trades, unstable applications, and so on and so on. So you, don't, you just don't test with the uh, application that you developed. Do you test uh, the tools against other applications as well? Yeah, sometimes. I don't necessarily publish all the results, but I test it against WhatsApp, Vet, uh, a couple of other uh, broken applications. Mm-hmm. Pretty much, that, that's pretty much the process. It gets a bit more complicated because I'm evaluating so many things these days, but uh, that's the outline. So how many web application scanners uh, have you tested? And you just recently published uh, an update on, on all of them, correct? About 66. Six, 66 different tools. Wow. Yeah, 66. Wow. So now of those 66 tools which aim to evaluate web application security, What's one thing that they all seem to do pretty well? Like, is there a classification of attacks or certain kind of ways they assess that uh, are all, for the most part, pretty good amongst all those tools? Well, these days, in 2015, assuming the tool can actually identify which part of the protocol it wants to scan, like XML, JSON, GET, POST, they all do SQL injection cross-site scripting pretty well. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, all the rest, the more exotic flavors, crawling different technologies, that's kind of debatable. That changes between technology to technology. But mm-hmm. the basics are all pretty well implemented these days. What are some of the top things that these tools struggle with today? Well, definitely new technology. Yeah. New technology, is in, it's running so fast that it's hard for them to catch up, like AngularJS or... Other uh, HTML uh, presentation layers. I mean, it's pretty hard to call these, pass these, and identify the locations it actually needs to be scanned. <clears throat> so most of them are actually struggling these days with the newest technologies, and they're catching up eventually. Mm. Now, what about authentication? That's always been the thing that has really been a thorn in my side when I test web application scanners, is how well they implement authentication how well they can actually stay logged into the application for the duration of the scan, as you and I can see you smiling. That's it's certainly a challenging thing. Um, but, you know, what, what, uh, what is your assessment of that? Oh, it's kind of related to technology as well, because these days there's so many different ways to authenticate. There's OWASP and there's Kerberos and there's SAML. And again, so many technologies to support just for authentication. And there's the whole problem of... Uh, figuring out whether or not you're logged in or not. What if the authentication is implemented in an external API? So it's it's getting more and more complicated. Uh, I think they're still trying to catch up. I think it's an endless struggle. If you want to pick your uh, technology, you want to pick your web application scanner, you have to make sure it's kind of either adapted or can be adapted to whichever authentication or input vector technology you have in your organization. Now, I almost feel as, as we talk about authentication that there are kind of, there are really two different audiences in my opinion. I'm curious to see what your thoughts are. There's your um, assessor, your penetration tester, and then there's the person whose responsibility is to provide security for their organization, and they have to do web application scanning as well. So given that, what, what tools, I hate to have you recommend a specific tool because you've done a great job of staying independent, Chai, but are there, wh- which tools... Uh, should the penetration tester today consider having in their toolkit for web application scanning? Well, for a pen tester, 
there's a couple of considerations, but a pen tester, unlike somebody in organization, has to be able to test for a large amount of technologies. Okay, so specific of organizations, the security employee, the guy in the security team, he needs to, set, to test whatever the organization is using. Well, let's say a specific organization is relying primarily on XML or REST web services. He can pick a scanner that specializes on these technologies. Pentester really has to support as much as possible. Mm. So you should definitely select a web application scanner that supports at least the main technologies he's facing on a daily basis. So let's say he deals with JSON, XML, kind of uh, REST, or any other specific input delivery vectors. You should select a scanner that supports as many as possible. Okay? For a web application pen tester, it's also a bit less important, if it's good, to select something that's kind of good in a point and shoot scenario. A pen tester can really invest the time and effort to properly configure his assessment tool. A guy in a security firm, he, of course he has deadlines and so on and so on, he doesn't necessarily, and I'm sure it's not necessarily the case, but he doesn't necessarily have the same speciality as the pen tester. He probably needs a point and shoot, uh, a tool that supports a point and shoot scenario better, like something that crawls really well and uh, does some automated tasks and that kind of does almost everything on its own, it's probably best for someone in a, in a security firm with, or someone in a security department in a large firm. I noticed you haven't mentioned any particular vendor or product, and we're a little ways into the interview. I'm very impressed, Shai. You've managed to answer my questions without saying any one particular product or vendor on the list. I'm going to get, I'm gonna get you. I'm going to get you in this interview. <laughs> I can recommend many of them, but I think I'm be, I've been researching this field for more than five years now. It's not that there's that there's many good tools. There's many tools that are, they will be good someday, okay? Mm. And I can't recommend anyone which is the best. There's the best in which field. It's really true. I really believe that. I mean, some tools are really great for specific technologies uh, and or for specific purposes. Others are better at other technologies. You really have to know what you're testing. Mm. No, that's interesting. What is um, what is your assessment between uh, free and or open source tools versus commercial tools? Well, open source tools are catching up. I can tell you that. They the gap was pretty big in I guess 2012, 2011, obviously before that. But these days they're pretty accurate. Some of them are actually easy to use. But um, I guess. For most commercial tools, they're much easier to use. Most of them are a bit more stable and a bit more, uh, I guess, flexible, easy to configure, and so on and so on. I can't say that for all tools, especially not for all commercial tools versus all open source tools, but that seems to be the typical case. It seems to me that um, in the past year, maybe couple of years, that web application scanning vendors have really made the leap into cloud and software as a service. What's your assessment and what's the use case for these cloud-based software as a service web application scanners? Yeah, I think the all migration to the cloud is a really important thing, A, because customers are responding pretty well to it, and because the culture of assessing your websites on a regular basis actually started to catch up. So the whole periodic assessment uh, kind of placed a lot of challenges for those vendors. A, they had to deliberately reduce some of the tests. So yeah. a standalone web application engine does a lot of tests. And if you do all of those tests on your production website on a regular basis, you can actually cause a lot of harm. You can uh, kind of overload your whole support department with requests. You can cause your website to crash and so on and so on. Right. So you can crash your database like I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can actually succeed. <laughs> yeah. You can actually succeed in the tests too much. So right. the challenge was to kind of provide value while reducing the not necessarily a relevant tests which can cause harm and add more and more piles of tests like tests for web malware, tests for infrastructure issues, and so on and so on. So most of the vendors got pretty well. 
and got started doing it pretty well. Some of them still struggle in certain areas. Some vendors actually started, instead of just uh, providing the whole bunch, started specializing only in the app layer or only in the infrastructure layer. Mm. So there's some, some sort of uh, specialized vendors. But eventually, I, I'm guessing most vendors would kind of do all in ones in those areas. Yeah, I'm really encouraging folks now to kind of rethink how they do web application security and really look at um, it, it kind of integrating it into your vulnerability management program and saying, I'm going to get a cloud service and I'm going to scan my websites from the outside because I think technology has progressed to that point where we can do that now. Whereas even a year ago uh, or two, that, that didn't exist, right? Yeah, not in that scale, not, not like today. Mm, that's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> What are some of the other things that um, kind of you get frustrated with when you work with all the tools? Like I know when I was testing, doing some testing of various tools, you know, the 404 page detection, rewrite rule detection, the way they were configured in the various tools were very different. Um, you know, how have some of those things frustrated you and what are some of the techniques that are built in some of the better tools uh, that are dealing with some of those issues? Well, the first thing that... Uh it's kind of a challenge is something called the result consistency. So funny thing, if you take a scanner and you scan a small sized application, 20 pages, 30 pages, you'll get certain results. But if you take the same scanner, in most cases, not all, and you scan a, I don't know, a 1,000 pages simultaneously, it will often miss, provide, present different results, uh, show up some false positive and so on and so on. So it won't handle all threading, multiple response, load, as well as it uh, handle a small sized application, okay? So in many cases, in my case, I have to scan like small groups of URL just to verify how does it do when it's in ideal conditions compared mm -hmm. to how it's doing in, in a real world scenario. So in a real world scenario, you won't have time to configure scanner to scan 30 URLs at a time. You'll Press play, scan, especially in the cloud scenario, you scan your web application. What if this web application has 5,000 5, pages? Okay, so that's kind of one challenge. Another one is obviously false positive. That's a, a big challenge. It's getting better these days. Mm. I, I'll say that many vendors are improved in those scenarios where in 2009, 2006, even 2012, you'll get a ton of false positives. These days, it's kind of decreasing. It's not in the same, uh, it's not decreasing as fast for all tests. So a certain vendor might be very good in SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and very bad in, let's say, obsolete files, hidden directories, and other aspects. So they're progressing on a, a, in different, uh, I guess, they're not progressing as fast in all plugins as they are in the more visible plugins, plugins that people are already aware that they're being assessed, but eventually they'll get there. Mm. Um, Larry, did you have questions for Shai from I the penetration not. testers kind of standpoint doing web application <laughs> assessments? I mean, Shai has tested 60 plus tools. I, I so. know, which is awesome. So it's really cool. Um, I don't off the top of my head, no. Okay. Because um, he made some really great points about the, the 25 versus 1,000, which is a lot yeah. of problems that we run into. Um, not that I can think of. So, Shai, uh, tell us about WAVSEP. Uh, at what point did you develop <coughs> WAVSEP? Why? And, and how does it work? And how can people use it to their advantage? Well, um, in 2009, when I started to actually perform the initial evaluation, I was inspired by a, the work of a guy named Larry Suto. Uh, I'm not sure if you interviewed him in the past, or you probably heard his name a lot. So I saw one of his benchmarks and I decided, uh, yeah, it's probably easy. I'll test uh, all the tools I've got against some web application and see the results. And I wasn't even uh, kind of thinking of publishing it yet. But what I got was very interesting. I saw that some tools identified vulnerabilities that the others didn't. So I was sure that those tools were the best. And then I ran uh, some other tools which were kind of anonymous these days, a tool called Audibus, probably nobody these days even remembers it uh, ever existed. It was pretty good, by the way. It, it didn't identify some of the instances that high-end, uh, well-known security tools identified, but it identified other issues in the same applications that none of the other tools managed to identify. And then I figured out that 
some tools may be good in the same attacks that they identify identifying certain classifications of the attack, and others are pretty good identifying other scenarios. So I started implementing the first pages of WhatsApp, which are kind of trying to cover all the base scenarios for the attack, like attacks that will only be identified using time-based payloads, attacks mm -hmm. that will only be identified with semicolons, attacks, and so on and so on, with the attacks that will only be identified with evasions, and so on and so on. So, on. so it kind of got big. I, I think it got into about 200 pages in the first initial list of WhatsApp. And uh, I started testing, I think it was 42 uh, scanners in the initial release, and then I figured out that the content was pretty good, that actually, I think many, many different uh, scanners got less than 30%, and uh, I think the best one got 60%, something like that. It was very interesting. Wow. It actually told you which ones were usable, which ones weren't, which ones uh, crashed on a regular basis, something that pen testers and uh, security consultants can actually use. So I initially published it, like it was uh, an open source comparison of 42 scanners, and I kind of published it and tweeted it and kind of gotten into testing how people responded to the article. I started seeing reviews in Japan and Korea and people were questioning my sanity, which is understandable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can understand that. I mean, it's not the same thing to do, but... I, th I really thought this was your full-time job, uh, evaluating web app tools, but it's not. You have a, a, a day job. This is your part-time thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was uh, my full-time nightlife, I guess, mm -hmm, full-time. Mm -hmm. like, it kind of came with the expense of sleep. Right. Itself. So uh, uh, how, has been, uh, how have you interacted with the web application scanning vendors um, you know, what is that relationship like? It was kind of interesting as I spoke with web application scanning vendors for my own project as I was evaluating them for, for various <coughs> reasons, uh, your name would come up. No one said anything bad about you, which, I mean, makes sense, right? No one wants to say anything bad about the guy that's evaluating all the web app tools. Um, but, I mean, they were, all, they were all correct in assessing your character, in my opinion. But what is your um, relationship been like with the web app vendors? At first, I didn't really contact anyone, and I didn't have a, a plan. I was learning how to interact with the different vendors. In the second benchmark, which actually started to include commercial vendors, I blundered like a million times in those interactions. But I initially took, I mean, I took upon myself to not express any specific opinions, A, because I knew that any opinion won't be accurate. I can't say that one tool is better because it may be better in certain areas and mm -hmm. I don't, since I don't cover 100% of the aspects, just a portion of it, it's unwise and it's probably inaccurate to state anything like that. So I started, I, I kind of decided that I would produce results as accurate as I can and I'd let the audience decide what he wants to do with them. Instead of expressing opinions like this tool is best and this tool isn't, uh, and so on and so on. So initially I uh, didn't, I contacted some of the vendors. I had some guys that were uh, excited about my first article, helped me out, out of uh, specific vendors. Actually, some of them almost got fired for it, <laughs> for helping me really? out. Because, yeah, because some of the vendors weren't open initially mm -hmm. to the interaction with the benchmark. They thought I was going to express opinions and like yeah. certain vendors, it was so not the case. I mean, that's interesting. I so over over time, they've learned to trust you because in in my experience, um, they'll actually a lot of them will will if I mention that hey, I'm scanning WavSep with this, they'll be like, oh yeah yeah yeah, we know shy. You know, here's our our help guide on how to you know scan WavSep with our tool, and it's clear that almost all the vendors have worked with you in some capacity uh, up until today, right? Yeah, it, it's taken time to mm -hmm. build that trust, obviously. And uh, these days, I think 99% cooperate, and that's that's amazing. And they all, actually, they help me up a lot. They, they point out bugs and, and stuff like that I have to fix. Uh, so I guess... Over time, initially, some of them were angry and frustrated and thought I was taking some vendor side. And over time, when they saw that they, there's no bias, I'm not taking anyone's side and presenting pure stats and actually helping people reproduce it, I think they saw the value in that because 
some of them were actually able to invest time and effort and prove to their audience that they're really good in a certain area without anyone questioning it, mm -hmm. okay? And anyone can actually reproduce the results themselves if they follow the detailed configuration and see that the vendors aren't making any false claims. I right. think that, that they, once they figured out that that was valuable and I'm not taking anyone's side, it got a lot easier. Have any of the vendors given you a job offer? Put a job offer on the table? Yeah, and uh, unfortunately I can't take it, even even if they pay really <laughs> right. amazing sums. Because, well, I, it I would mean, invalidate your result, right? Any tie that you would have to a vendor would invalidate your results, right? Yeah, which can, which is kind of the, the, the problem here. So I can't take any specific vendor job offers, and I had to turn out uh, quite a few, not even uh, because my aim isn't just for application scanners, actually. Mm -hmm. So application firewalls yeah. and source code analysis tools, and I have like my whole roadmap of products to to go to. It's kind of I can't work for any one of those, at least in the visible future. Yeah, I mean, if you want to continue on your roadmap of evaluating web scanning tools, web app firewalls, you can't take a job. But if someone offered you your dream job, you'd have to make that that tough choice, right? I, I do provide consulting, it kind of like private benchmarks to mm -hmm. certain organizations in the field. It's kind of like uh, investors that want to purchase technology, mm -hmm. which is something I'm really excited about. I mean, they want to evaluate certain aspects in an engine, the WAF engine or scanner engine or science engine. So I have some extra side jobs for, for these or for uh, cloud vendors that aren't part of my top 10 in any uh, given technology. So. As an engagement, I kind of add them to offset. But as a general rule, I don't work as, a, 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 as an employee with any of the vendors. Um, Michael, you've been quiet over there. Not in my head a lot, though. Yeah, I, yeah, I see you. I do. I, I see you. You're, you're really engaged in it. That's great. We thank you for that. Um, <laughs> no, <you've seen> Stones <laughs> busted. Um, now, I'm sure Jack included, Larry, Michael, you guys have seen a lot of different evaluations of technologies, yeah, yeah. right? Have you ever, now that we've kind of gone through a lot of it with Chef, have you ever seen one of this, no. this nature? What, what, no, this one, is why you're watching me shake my head. Yeah. One, one of this caliber and one of this independence. Yes. Um, and I, it's one of those things that I, I think that Shai is doing an absolute fantastic thing for the community at large and someone should throw lots of money at him just for thank you, um, without any sort of possibility of conflict of interest, conflict of interest yeah. for that stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, so. that's, a, that's a tough thing, Shai. We were talking yeah. about you know, a job offer. It's tough to take funding for something like this because whoever's giving you the funding could potentially be perceived as having influence over the results. Well, actually, I've been struggling with that a lot because not having funding in the initial uh, uh, benchmarks, it kind of meant I was doing it on my own, on my spare time and overnight. Actually, mm. I, was on, I think it was in the third benchmark. It was like two days before I got married. I was like, <laughs> it was like the last iteration we post pu pu uh, publishing the article. And my wife was, my uh, back then girlfriend was looking at me, you know we're getting married in two days. Yeah. It's 5 a.m. and you're working on this damn business. <laughs> <laughs> but now, so, yeah, how, long, how long did your first benchmark take to, uh, to produce? No, the first, the first one was relatively uh, short. Mm -hmm. Short is like half a year, six months, seven months. The last one was like 18 months. Yeah. And by the wow. time I got into publishing it, I, I realized it was so much content that I figured out that in order to publish all of it, I'll have to invest another year. So that's the first time ever I had to cut a content I was about to publish. I decided mm -hmm. I'll publish it over time instead of just waiting for it to be perfect. It was really hard for somebody like me like to present part of the content and right. like postpone something. But uh, I'm, I guess it's part of the process of learning how to interact with all this data and you know? mm. kind of making this research possible to make it, to maintain it and so on and so on. Well, actually, that's, I mean, that's interesting because, uh, look, I, I have been nodding despite the crap everybody's giving me. I, I think the work that you're doing is phenomenal. But, but what I like about it is the integrity that you've put into it and the integrity into the process. So there's the integrity that you have as a person that's, that's laudable and I like it very much. But what's your, did you have a background to look at research methods and benchmarking and processes or have you learned it on the fly? And either way from that, 
if somebody else were looking at evaluating stuff, what's something you've learned? So we've got a ton of security leaders that listen to this program that are always tasked with making good choices. And I liked how when Paul was asking questions earlier, you talked about, well, what's the problem you're trying to solve? So what are some things that you've learned? Like what, would, what was your background going into this? How have you improved? What have you learned since then? And what can other security leaders take away from your experience? Not from your work. I mean, they should go read your work and, and benefit from it, but. Well, um, first of all, as far as methods, I think it's more a matter of character than actually in any official training I've got, I guess. I'm kind of a perfectionist in some <laughs> aspects. <laughs> Not surprising. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I kind of try to uh, cover all the possibilities and figure out all the directions before I get into any specific task. So it wasn't any different with WAFSEP and the web scanner evaluations. So uh, as far as the process itself, I have to admit it, I was surprised so many times in during that process. And if, any, if there's any advice I can give to any security researcher is whenever you're sure something and when you're about to decide something and decide that that's the way things are, you're going to be surprised over time because as you learn more about a specific field, those conclusions change and they change rapidly. So at first, initially, I was certain that a specific scanner was well or that the process of evaluating scatters should go to a, a specific path. And the more I'm doing those researches, the more I'm learning how much more there is to it and how much more undecisive the data is, how much more is missing to make good choices, okay? Well. Yeah. So uh, one of the things you learned, Shai, was that different vendors, very similar, I think, to the antivirus or anti-malware vendors, different vendors would call different types of attacks or detections for attacks different things. And there was no standard naming convention. So you took it upon yourself to create a project and I actually tweeted it out uh, the other day and lots of people were like, oh my God, this is great. So I was wondering if you could talk about that project. So it, it, that, that project actually derives from a couple of things. So eight different vendors name different uh, features that they support using completely different name. Let's take, for example, OASP calls a specific attack on validated redirect. Another vendor calls the same, the same attack phishing via redirection. And another vendor calls the same attack open redirect. A specific customer or consumer using the product and searching for specific things will have a hard time, especially for the different plugins, to figure out what it is the scanner is finding. So out of uh, the necessity to kind of create a common background, and in addition to that, also managed to cover more territory. I wanted to be able to map out features in a lot more product much faster. I created a project called uh, RVR. It stands for a uh, relative vulnerability rating. And the purpose was A, to map out which vectors are more important than others. Now, that's a hard concept and there's like probably a million people who will argue with me on any decision, but I had to have some basis, like figuring out that SQL injection is more crucial as an attack vector than cross-site scripting, or that uh, OS commanding is more important than uh, open redirect. So I started covering like and gathering all those attack vectors from lists such as OSP attacks and vulnerabilities, OSP top 10, uh, CAPEC, CWE, like a million lists out there that I, I honestly didn't know existed before that. Uh, some of them are some of the vectors were published in remote blogs, some of them were mentioned in tweets and there weren't any other ways to get them. So I kind of started gathering uh, them and got to an amazing amount of generic attacks. Now, I'm not talking about uh, specific vulnerabilities in specific software, like something is found in CV. I'm talking about a completely unique attack vector, like something like blah blah injection, SQL injection, memcached injections. So I got to about 300 of those. I started gathering them up and say, hey, mapping those uh, to web application scanners and web application firewalls would be amazing because people will actually know what it is they're covering in a pen test, not in comparison to another scanner, in comparison to everything they should mm -hmm. test or everything that they should protect. So think about the current <coughs> statement. Let's say you have an application and you're supposed to protect it. 
if you knew that your web application firewall only protects 5%, you'd know that you need additional, that you need to take additional steps to protect your application. But if you just select a product because it's a web application firewall and it costs a certain amount, you're kind of avoiding what you need to say, to see, okay? So I started mapping features and scanners. That's part of the process. It took so long. I mean, just going over Koalis features, they have like 80,000 plugins and Nisus features. They have a whole lot of features. And Jack there, I'm sure you, you can smile. There's like a million features that Nisus has. I started reading all those plugins, trying to figure out all those. All those. I actually mapped all of Nisus and I mapped all of Koalis and never published it because I realized that I should do that to all the rest. So I started saying to myself, hey, it would be nice if the, in, in addition to the names, I'll get videos for all, the, all of them and CWE mapping. And that started becoming like a whole process of mapping the features to videos from conferences and uh, I guess kind of gathering content to make the list attractive for other purposes, not just mapping security products. And that's pretty much what this list is today. It's a, uh, can I send the name? I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Question, I tweeted, so. I tweeted it out there the other day. It's uh, techapi.com, T-E-C-A-P-I.com. Yeah. Kind of like a technology evaluation community API, or that's the vision of it. Um, it it's kind of useful the way, the way it is. Like if you wanted to learn something about a specific uh, attack vector, which is generic, or even wanted to map out which attack vectors are relevant for your technology. Let's mm -hmm. say you have SP.NET MVC, you can actually see which attack vectors are relevant for SP.NET MVC, okay? You, there's a button there that uh, goes to a tabular view, and from there you can actually filter by technology. The whole kind of bootstrap presentation, it's more for mobile or other devices, which will be readable. But you can filter it using different uh, criteria. So that that's one uh, that's one aspect of it. And eventually what I'm planning to do is to map uh, as much projects as I can using this list, okay? Like get the support of application scanners for it, get the support for application firewalls for it, source code analysis tools, and so on and so on. And it's already undergoing. I've got... a uh, help for uh, many, many volunteers, uh, a guy called uh, Blessing Thomas, which is helping me a lot, and uh, a couple of guys from Turkey and from India, uh, which are helping out, I mean, which is amazing. I was really surprised to get mails from volunteers, which was amazing, I mean, just good people. They're just doing it for the community and to publish the content, they have zero interest. Yeah, it was a great resource uh, for, for the community. It was great for me because as you, when you start evaluation, evaluating web application scanners, which tool am I going to use in a pen test? Which yeah. tool am I going to use to scan my website all the time? You read through the vendor or open source tools documentation. You find a blog entry about <laughs> yeah. technology X, Y, or Z. And you're like, wait, what is that attack? Hold on. Uh -huh. like, I need the yeah. background. Like, I need to understand the context and more about this attack before I can go read the article about like, how to configure Burp Intruder to go exploit this attack. Like, I need some of the background. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, Shai created that site for me. Thanks. <laughs> That's awesome because now you can get the background in understanding and like, it's conference videos about yep. where this attack was, you you know, can, came from. You can guarantee that some of my next web application tests are yeah. going to be web app. Shy's website. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's an awesome, awesome yeah. resource. Yeah, very cool. Uh, Michael, did you have more more questions for Shy? No. Okay. I'm a, I'm a, I'm feeling a little shy. Oh, Apollo has questions. Go ahead, Apollo. So uh, I build websites, and <laughs> I love playing around with scanners. So one of the things I've seen. So for example, if you use Rails Goat, I love using that as an example. They have one attack where you can do privilege escalation. You basically make your user account into an admin. Now, doing the attack is easy. You just said you do a post to user update. You set yourself as is admin is true. That's it. But the hard part is the verification. So one of the problems I see with a lot of scanners is that they just inherently, because they're being used against multiple apps, cannot take into account the architecture of a given system. Mm -hmm. So what do you, what do you think about that? Do you see the scanners as you know, a really robust solution, or should we take into account these kind of limitations? Well, A, they're improving, and they're improving quite rapidly. And actually, doing what, what you said exactly, some of the vendors, actually, 
the, the number of that support it is quite it's kind of growing support recording a certain structure of a website and assigning it a specific like imaginary privilege and then calling the website again after then under different privileges mm-hmm. and when you do that with that those specific vendors they will actually if they're good map out the differences and manage to identify attacks using parameters like is admin or actually just forceful browsing attacks so some vendors have it to a certain degree it's it's not perfect none of the plugins are perfect but given feedback these guys are in pre, are, are improving those uh, features in their product so my point of view is that even though it's not good or necessarily perfect today five years from now three years from now ten years from now mm-hmm. all of those features will be pretty good Interesting. I'm not sure those yeah they won't replace the human and not in the next 50 years but they'll be able to do things pretty good like in 2005 you, you could literally couldn't trust your web application scanner in any ways there were so many false positives mm-hmm. but I think these days not using an automated tool it, it's it's really it's a shame you're, you're missing out so much good content that can help you out I mean mm. so another thing I've noticed too there's an article I believe from uh um, contrast security came out a few days ago and it was saying that the majority of security scanners for web apps do not allow you to scan web APIs and in particular restful services. What have you seen with that? Some do. It's a complicated process just to uh, scan those, <clears throat> those REST APIs because you have to define a pattern like hmm. a pattern that logs in first and then goes to a certain uh, REST API and then goes to another. So defining those sequences is kind of hard for web application scanner of any vendor because you'd have, you want your scanner to kind of figure out the pattern on its own. And that's really hard. Mm. But even Contrast and other products like that, because they uh, other products in the, IS, uh, in the YAST category, because they rely on a human recording those scenarios, it's much easier for them. But it's, even if a pen test used an IS tool, it would still have to record the scenarios. So doing the same in a web application scanner that supports this feature would give somehow somewhat similar, similar results. But overall, yes, that's a problem, obviously. Identifying okay. different sequences. Do you think, so I work with clients here and they're making web apps. Sometimes we find security vulnerabilities that no scanner has found. So that exists. Um, and what we've done is built our own security scannings uh, test for this. So do you think it would be a good idea for a lot of security vendors that are developing software to start with the scanners and then as they find these weird edge case security flaws, start making their own scanners? Well, um, that, that's an interesting one because from a, a market analysis perspective, if you have a business idea behind your scanner with your extra plugins, you're going to have a rough time because of the amount of competition in the market. There's so many competitors. I mean, there's 25 plus commercial scanners out there, not including cloud vendors and so on and so on. There's so many engines. So out of, from a commercial perspective, it's, it's a tough market these days. How about just Probably for internal recommend. usage? Yeah, that's amazing. For internal usage, that would actually give you an edge because mm. you'll be able to find things that other people don't. Something smarter, just take an engine that's already there, that's open, like kind of support external plugins, and write your plugins for that scanner. It has so many different mechanisms already in place, like a time-based analysis and responses and supporting call, support for calling and other aspects that you can use for your plugin. Mm. So write your own plugins, amazing. I totally recommend that. I actually do that in my own kind of day job. That's what I do. I write plugins for myself as well. Okay. Some of them I publish, some of them I don't, but that, that kind of them makes sense. Writing it all on my own without any engine behind it. I don't know. It's, it's too much work in my opinion. Yeah. The only downside, I, I, again, I encourage everyone to do that. The only downside I see is that some of the tests are so extraordinarily architecture specific that they are effectively useless to anyone else. Mm-hmm. So for example, um, trying to access someone else's user information. You know, I can write an attack for that, I can write the verification for that, but because of the, the architecture of the system, I don't think anyone else could ever use it. Mm-hmm. So I think that's one of the downsides to doing that, to publishing it, at least. Yeah, I get it. I mean. I mean, it's okay if there's no moral issue with keeping your own special test in your own company. I mean, that's kind of the age that you're selling as a pen tester. 
security consulting. That's okay. I mean, from a, a community point of view, I think eventually it's really important for the community to get that feedback. I mean, so we can all improve eventually. You we'll may be able to get and find more and more specific issues to keep in your company. Not mm -hmm. publishing vulnerabilities at all. It's kind of a different model, more fitting for like the uh, for military industries and uh, kind of uh, homeland defense industries, less for the security community as a whole. But overall, I, mean, I guess you're right. I mean, it's much easier to write your own plugins for your own specific use, and they won't necessarily help everyone all the time. Plus, there's so much security content and tools out there. I think these days it's really hard to encourage people and make them use your tool, even if it's great, because there's so much competition and there's so much things to test. I mean, in Wi-Fi security, in SAP security, and so many fields. I mean. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I had this chat earlier with Nick. Um, you know, when you start really getting security, you start realizing it's not just the application; it's the architecture, it's the OS, it's the network. Like it's just this kind of rabbit hole you fall down when you start really getting into yeah, it. Yeah, and Shai, I wanted to ask you more questions along those lines. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so we're just going to have to bring you back at, at a later time. <laughs> um, but I do want to ask you five more really quick questions. Uh, are you ready for playing five questions with Security Weekly? Sure. Three words to describe yourself. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Shai Chen. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, definitely a um, machine gun. I think RPD would do it. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Me, myself, and my PC. <laughs> nice. I in, like that one. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Oh. Do you put the name of the game? <laughs> it, it's Ask Grabby Grabby. It's very popular in Europe, especially Berlin. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> only, only when you're there, Larry. <laughs> only, only when you visit uh, Berlin. Well, I, I'll, go for, I'll go for the first. I want to see what happens there first. You go. There you go. Uh, Shai, choose two celebrities to be your parents. Well, Kylie Mina would be one. Okay. And, well, second one would be a tough one. It is. It's a tough question. Yeah, yeah. They can be alive or dead. We don't necessarily have to recognize them instantly. Celebrity is loosely interpreted in this question. Can they be fictional <clears throat> yep. characters? I, I would say, yeah. Blackout right now. Fictional characters are okay. One, yeah. one might argue, given the recent Congress passing, that it doesn't have to be. That's right. Between a man and a woman. Man and woman could be male, male, be. female, female, male, yeah. female. Uh, I guess I'd get Einstein. I mean, it would be interesting to have a couple of discussions and go, then go sleep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Very good, Shai. Always nice speaking with you. Thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Uh, have a good night. I know it's late there, so we'll let you go. Very. <laughs> Bye, guys. And thank you. Thanks, Shai. And with that, we will take a short break, come back, and we're going to talk about the top 10 reasons why you <laughs> want to get into information security. Because that's not going to be a controversial no. discussion. <laughs> I've got, and, and I've got my own thoughts on that one, too. Two cocktails in, so stay tuned. Dude.